different from the challenges that Harvard University had to establish, had to you know, address when it was established 300 years ago. You know, um, many of these, and this relates to my second point, a lot of the rankings and quality today is based on inputs. So we look at inputs like, you know, what professor, how many uh, PhDs uh, do you have on staff? Um, you know, what, how many computers do you have? How many, how much land do you have? How many credit hours do you spend? But yet we're talking about a challenge that this continent faces. We're running out of time. By, the, you know, in 18 years we'll need to have 1.1 billion jobs that this continent needs. The U.S. didn't have that challenge when they were setting up their universities. So, you know, we need a different vehicle to get there. And I think we should rather be looking at outputs to track quality. Let's look at outputs. So track the quality of a university by how many, what percentage of its graduates are getting jobs. Um, you know, what percentage of them are becoming entrepreneurs and how many jobs are those entrepreneurs creating? What sort of patents and, and innovation are coming out of the, the university? What skills are the graduates coming out with? How are they applying those skills to solve African problems? Those things are not on the rankings list. So if we go that way, we are going to build universities that are no longer relevant for the context that we're in. Right. Let me just bring in uh, uh, Minister Malimba. Thank you. Thank you for your submission. And it seems like we, we can't run away from the ranking issue uh, because uh, Minister Malimba, uh, the Africa Capacity Report of the SCBF uh, ranks Rwanda as third uh, in science, technology, and innovation capacity. Speak to us in regards to that, looking at, if you look at history, Rwanda is a fairly young country. How were you able to do this in answering the question of quality? <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, this goes to, uh, it starts with the policy level and uh, the significant amount of investment uh, the government of Rwanda has been uh, investing in enhancing the value of partnership. Uh, if we start from the question of uh, the traffic of students uh, leaving African continent, uh, going to U.S., uh, to Europe, or elsewhere, we need to start uh, by looking at those factors which actually necessitate this one direction flow of students. Now, as a solution maybe to curtail that flow of students from uh, Rwanda and the other parts of uh, Africa going to oversee, we needed to bring those institutions here in Rwanda so that uh, instead of uh, seeking you know, that qualification which is attainable in those universities, the government of Rwanda has created a strong partnership to, act, to attract this institution to come here. And the living example is the, the Carnegie Mellon University, is the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, is African Leadership University, and a couple of other centers of excellence which has been set up here. So uh, looking at the, from the policy issue, and the prospect which comes with these institutions, either from the region or from the global. Of and the commitment and significant investment, which of course, both in short term and long term, is going to add significantly into the creation of the 21st century knowledge in science, technology, innovation, and creativity. Right, and, and thanks for making it very clear that there has to be some intentionality from policymakers in terms of these homegrown solutions don't just happen, right? There's some policy that needs to go into that. Well, but we're talking about policy. Let me just bring in, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, let me just uh, bring in Mr. Kato on the issue of those collaborations and that sort of synergy. He's talked about policy, he's talked about homegrown solutions and designing institutions that meet the African need. But I think it's important also to work with people who've already been. Thank you very much. And um, before answering that question, I'd like to take a, of, um, a little bit of time to explain why I'm here, because many of you 
might be wondering why a representative of the Japanese agency is sitting here. Um, the, uh, to make a long story short, uh, we learned of, of the idea of establishing a sustainable development goal center in, in Kigali uh, some one and uh, half years ago. And we thought it would be a very worthwhile endeavor and uh, became interested and have been working together with Dr. Belay uh, and other leaders of the uh, center to what will, uh, the two organizations can uh, do together to uh, achieve this uh, uh, laudable goals. And another reason is that the Toshitori education improvement is one of the agendas that the Japanese government is um, putting an emphasis on. That's why I'm here. So I'm sorry for this uh, short uh, introductory sure. remarks. And to, to get back to uh, the uh, uh, question, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I got your question uh, completely right, but um, let me tell you what, how I see the issue of quality of tertiary education. And there are a number of ways to interpret or how, uh, define the quality of education in, in university. But I think the biggest testimony of good quality education in, in university is how uh, the graduates can find jobs, the uh, employability of the graduates. And um, the issues that we have had in uh, Tunisia, the Arab Spring, is a testimony that the perhaps uh, there is a mismatch between what is demanded by the private sector and what is supplied by the universities. So one hypothetical way of um, giving an answer to this uh, complex question, somewhat simplified answer, would be to make ed uh, university education more practical oriented, problem sol solving oriented one, rather than theoretical or um, academic ones. Well, uh, to, um, I'm making a very simplified discussion, but maybe making the educational system more engineered, geared toward the needs of the private sector and the community of African countries is the key. And how can we do that? Well, there is no panacea for this uh, challenging, uh, challenging task, but we have some experiences working together with some African counterparts, like the Jomo Kenya at the University of uh, Agriculture and Technology, the vice chancellor of which is going to talk about this afternoon later. Uh, we have done a couple of uh, efforts to uh, uh, change the way that a, a university education is uh, provide, provided. And thanks to the efforts of the university, the, the employment rate of the graduates is very successful. So, if with um, appropriate uh, effort of the universities, we, we can surely co uh, improve the quality of university education defined in terms of the employability of their graduates. I have other issues, but let me stop here because, because of the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and gentlemen, it seems like we all agree to the fact, uh, to certain things here. <clears throat> and I think quality has a big correlation with the funding and the resources thereof. And I'd like to uh, bring Professor Sachs in this. Please speak to funding, uh, either from a status update point of view to where we need to go, but also I'd like to hear your uh, final word on this ranking conversation. Thank you very much. Let me start by saying that uh, the number of rankings and the bases of these rankings are evolving rapidly. So I wouldn't get too hung up about the specifics because by 2030, all of this is going to look very different. But what I would like to see is Africa uh, high on global lists. These lists are going to be on different criteria because there already is a lot of evolution. But I believe that the standards should be global standards, and we're going to see uh, very interesting new measurements for the reasons that were discussed. The whole nature of higher education is evolving, and in some very important and exciting ways. So one very basic point on financing. Information technology allows education at a much lower cost. If your university is not with wonderful broadband, it will have no chance to compete. So you better be connected with high bandwidth and with the capacity to participate in global information flows at a very high quality. And if the Ministry of Education is saying, we don't have the money for that, we don't have the time for that, then they don't have the time for your university. 
because universities depend now on their bandwidth. If you have it, it's a fixed cost that makes possible low cost delivery of quality in multiple ways. Let me give one example that I'm not an expert on except as a user, it may be farther along than I know, but if it's not, I'm gonna to help to solve this problem. When I get online in the morning at Columbia University, I access for free immediately 50,000 journals. The marginal cost of bringing Africa's universities to 50,000 journals is almost zero. So we should make sure that at a policy level that African universities have access either for free or at very low cost to what universities in the United States spend quite a bit of money on. But that's all right for this purpose. We need to make sure that there's an access for what is a zero marginal cost commodity right now, which is thousands and thousands of quality journals so that this is not a barrier. This is something that technology allows. You don't have to build a library of two million volumes. They're online. And, that's, and they're online basically at almost no marginal cost. You may be charged for them right now, exorbitant amounts, but that's a policy issue that we can break down, not a, a, an intrinsic economic factor. I would emphasize information technology is playing a huge role for leapfrogging and raising the quality. Courses online, distance education, research partnering, free library access, classrooms that are extended, one excellent professor teaching to 50 different universities on a screen, no problem. Virtual conferences, speeches, seminars that are globalized. This was not possible five years ago. This is where the leapfrogging can come in. We have to really be creative in opening up how the teaching is done, how the information is done, how the seminars are organized, who's a professor at what school, because now you can be virtually teaching anywhere. Right. That's really important. So I think the rankings, I want to put it aside a little bit. It's going to take care of itself because rankings that are old fashioned and backward looking, no one's going to look at anyway. The rankings themselves are going to change. But what is true is that excellence of education is a real thing. That's not a mirage. That's a real thing. Right. And so that we need to, to work on. And I think we, if we're creative, we can find all sorts of ways to open the channels for partnerships, for faculty exchanges, for broader curricula, for really leapfrogging. And I don't think this would have been possible 10 years ago, but I think it's possible now. Right, <clears throat> and thanks, Professor, for very clear tangible, practical ways of cutting the whole cost issue. One is uh, adoption of tech. Gentlemen, I'd like to stick a little I bit should, I should add one more thing if I could. I sure. want to help you raise money too. I'm not saying it's all free. I didn't mean to imply. <laughs> I just mean that there are low cost ways to do what used to come at very high cost. Right. So we should go both directions. Right. Lowering the cost and raising the funds. Correct. So let's dwell a little bit on that funding issue because for a lot of the universities uh, on the continent, it is a big problem. Let me just bring in Dr. Hamdok on this issue, uh, and, and, and just skipping to what the prof has said, very practical ways in which African institutions can uh, improve and work on this funding issue. Thank you very much. I think before getting to this issue of funding, I wanted to link this debate on uh, leapfrogging and also the policy making and research and linking to the issue of SDGs, eradicating poverty, and how linking research, policy making to this issue. I would like to believe the main issue here is to develop capabilities 
upgrading and all that in the sense that will help us to sustain the economic growth that is needed to address poverty. You know, to, uh, to, to eradicate poverty, you need to grow the economy for several decades at very high rate. This is extremely difficult. Very few countries were able to do it. But they have done it through building capabilities and upgrading their, their universities. If you take, I would just want to select this by, by a simple example of uh, South Korea, a country which was very similar to our economies some 40, 50 years ago. If you look at their uh, funding of building capabilities exemplified in the R&D, in 1980, uh, South Korea R&D as percentage of GDP was 0.7 percent. 85, it rose to 1.5 percent. By 2000, it went up to 2 percent. Today, it's around 4 percent. This is, shows clearly where the commitment is. South Korea is a very poor country in terms of natural resources and all that, but they made it the history that uh, they were having uh, per capita GDP less than Ghana in 1960. You can see them where they are. In the tertiary education enrollment, around 1980, it was about 10 percent. 85, it went to 30 percent. By 2000, it was 70 percent. R&D from the private sector was about 70 percent. These are things within our reach. I think and many of our countries are moving in these directions. I commend uh, Rwanda in 95. It was uh, the gross rate between 95 and uh, 2014. I think it was probably three or four digits change in terms of resources put into uh, R&D. So I think this is, this is an issue. But I, uh, going back to your question about funding education, we need to be innovative here. Government has to take the prime, as His Excellency the President said, responsibility for this, but it has to be in partnership with others. Mr. President, uh, you saw two days ago uh, when President Mugabe came in with this uh, cattle donated uh, to the Africa Foundation. I mean, many of us in the room were laughing at this and saying this is, I think there are so many ways of looking at innovative sources of funding our education. If you go to 1960s, when uh, the first univers National University of Botswana, Botswana was established, actually the seed money that established that university came from cattle donated by the chiefs in the country. The president went around and collecting this. This is one, one very small part of this thing, but I think the prime issue is to accord education and research and development and innovation the prime sort of uh, uh, priority when allocating resources. If we would like to develop, I think this is a way we need to, to, to move. Thank you. Right, and let me just bring in uh, Dr. Swanik on this, because it seems we are agreeing that government would like to help, the academia has the idea, but then there's a development world, and then all these three are operating in silos. If you look across our universities, less than 1% goes into R&D and innovation. How then do we make it a priority issue, Dr. Swanika? You know, I actually wanted to rather comment, let me rather talk on this cost issue because um, that's one place where I think uh, I'd like to offer an innovative solution to the cost issue. Um, for me, the finance of higher education has to address there's two angles. One is how do you reduce the cost and the second is are there innovative forms of student finance. So for example, um, we set out on a mission to develop three million leaders for Africa by 2060. And to do this, we realized we needed a very, very innovative model that would much lower cost, um, but also maintain the quality. So for example, today to go to um, a Western, if you go to Princeton University, for example, the degree is a four-year degree, and you pay $60,000 a year. So you spend $240,000 for a degree there. When we analyzed, though, the academic calendar of Princeton, we saw that their students are on vacation for between five to six months of the year. So you're paying $240,000 for 2.3 years of education. And so we said, That's, we can't afford to be on holiday for six months in Africa every year. We've got too many problems to solve. So in our model, we said, let's cut out the holiday. And rather, the students spend eight months on campus and four months in a job every year. So by the time they graduate, they already have year of work experience and 
you reduce the time they're there, so therefore you reduce the cost. We also completely re-engineered the way we use our real estate. And because of combination of online learning and peer learning and so forth, and, in, and, and we, we need much fewer classrooms. And as a result, Princeton, for example, has 900,000 square meters of space for 8,000 students. When we get to scale, we'll only need 80,000 80, square meters of space, one-tenth the space as Princeton by re-engineering, rethinking things. Yet, our students are being hired by the same companies that Princeton is hiring. So our students are being hired by Bain and Company, by McKinsey, by you know, IBM, all these companies, and the employers are so impressed that they're now coming to us and asking us to train their staff. So this is what I mean by thinking about a different model and attaining high quality but even at significantly lower cost. Now on the financing of these students, traditionally when higher education has been made accessible, there have been four methods. One is from government. Uh, the second is from uh, families themselves. The third might be philanthropy. And then the fourth is from you know, banks, private financial institutions. In Africa, we looked at and we figured that those four um, will not allow us to meet our goals. Governments are cash strapped. Families can't afford to pay fees, you know, uh, most, most families. Uh, private sector institutions, banks are charging 30 to 40% interest rates. And philanthropy is limited in terms of how, how, how it can, the scale it can reach. So we've created something called an income sharing arrangement, where we set up a finance company. It's called African Leadership Finance Corporation that actually attracts capital from investors, and then that capital finances the student's education. And then when the student graduates, it's not a loan that they have to pay with interest, but rather they share a percentage of their income back with the finance company. So they share 10% of their income for 10 years, and then you're not paying job, you're paying just a percentage. So what we're saying is that African students don't have the financing for their education today, but they will when they get a job. And so let them pay for their education after the fact. And Australia has done this on the national level, and, and, and today it finances about 30% of their higher education budget. So this would, I believe, is a way in which higher education can be made very accessible by re giving returns to investors, <coughs> universities get their revenue, and student gets a free or reduced cost education. And these are the kinds of innovative things we need to think about because, as I mentioned, the West didn't develop systems like this. They have student loan systems and that's become highly unsustainable. And we need different ways of doing things if we're gonna solve this problem. Right, and uh, let me just bring in uh, Dr. Price still on this. You mentioned in your earlier submission that we need to set priority areas as far as funding. There's no point of funding everybody at a mediocre level. Uh, speak to us uh, on specifics of how, with the limited resources coming from uh, the budgetary allocations, what are some of the specific areas uh, of priority that uh, governments or institutions or indeed ministries can put their money in? Uh, well, I was, I was differentiating between funding the educational project more generally, which I think should be widespread and some, something like a, a, an education fund could be used for that. And I agree with um, uh, the, 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 the idea of a, what's often called a contingent loan system. A system where students borrow money, or they pay their fees, and they pay afterwards uh, based on what they're earning. And actually Britain has that system, it's, quite, it's reasonably widespread, and South Africa happens to have that system as well. Um, but just as a lesson for others, it has to be adequately capitalized. Um, if you have the whole nation's, country, the whole nation's students uh, needing that funding and half of them can't get it, or they can only get half the funding and it runs out, then, then you have a bigger crisis. But I do think it's, it's, it's the right way to go. The research funding was the area where, I, which is what's required for the universities to bring a 30 or, or whatever into a um, world-class competitive basis. Um, and there I think you start, you, you have to assess I think you need to create critical masses at each university. Today, research and research programs are not unidisciplinary. So to fund only agriculture at one place and say that's the Center for Excellence for Agriculture, and that's the Center for Excellence for Marine Sciences, and that's for IT, I think misses the trends of development in research, which is actually that things are much more interdisciplinary today. If you're going to be studying SDG 
uh, urban, urbanization and urban sustainability, you're going to need social scientists, you're going to need civil engineers, you're going to need people who look at water and renewable energy, people who manage traffic, people who think about law and the environment. And so you actually want a university which is good at all of those areas. You need the critical mass across the, the area. So my view would be that you start off by prioritizing some institutions rather than prioritizing a particular discipline. You select those institutions that are most likely in the next 20 to 30 years because of their current, and it's going to be history, and, uh, for better or worse, um, and they've got significant numbers of researchers, they've got a research ethic, they've got significant numbers of people with PhDs, they've got decent uh, facilities already. That's where I think one should invest in, but not exclusively, and I make this point, but that it's not to create a massive divide between those and the rest. They, we, I would say that we should have on the continent a research fund, a bit like the European Union um, Horizon uh, 2020 fund, where the countries and other funders and donors have put money into research and then there's a competitive bidding process. And the requirement of the bid is that perhaps it should address an SDG or more, that there should be at least three universities that are selected from, the, um, from, this, uh, from this top 30 that are partners in that research program and that there should be uh, a number of other universities or centers of excellence which are outside of those uh, core um, universities that are included in as well, so that the investment is spreading to the continent more widely. But it will need some concentration if we're going to raise those institutions. Yeah. Right. And gentlemen, I'd like us to shift gears slightly uh, from the funding issue to sort of set some points of action as we go forward, right? The bulging youth population on the continent is obviously a blessing and a challenge, as has been well um, uh, documented. And I'd like to start with Mr. Uh, Kato on this issue of uh, have we equipped our young people well enough? The challenges notwithstanding, have we equipped them well enough to reap the demographic dividend? And what can we do now uh, in the circumstances that we find ourselves? Thank you. Uh, my point of view... Sure, Minister, then Mr. Kato. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, in my point of view, there are, three, um, there are three fundamental issues which we need to address. The first one has been talked about, actually, even through the key note remarks, and even one of the panelists here. It is teacher and faculty development, both uh, pre through professional continuous development strategy. But also we need to figure out how do we attract young brain, young talents to fall in love with the teaching profession, either at basic education or at the tertiary education. Number two, I think we need to harness um, the power of digital education because we are seeing that with the current development of information technology, actually knowledge and information is fungible. It is available everywhere. And most of the time, at free of cost or at a very cheap way. But the only difference which makes this information work elsewhere and not in Africa, it is the mode of delivery. Today, our teaching method, the teaching and learning method, is heavily overloaded through lecture system. But the lecturing system is the thing of the past. I think we need to focus on how we can enhance teaching and learning, either creating a problem for students to solve, or creating a project for students to work on, or by creating a product for the student to develop this product. And through either, be it problem-based learning, the project-based learning, or the product-based learning, these students, they can learn amount of information and cross discipline wise. The third area, it, we need to strike a very good balance between a developing of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but also in social science, because there is a lot of interrelationship and intermarriage between these two disciplines. But also, I think, on African continent, we've been emphasizing a lot in churning out the white collar job, and we are looking, lacking a critical mass of the people who have hands on skills. So development of the technical and vocation and training 
education is very key because today if you need one doctor, maybe you need seven other assistants to the doctors, either nurses or laboratory technicians. If you need one engineer, then you need seven technical middle level technicians who need to assist this engineer in order to work. If I take the case of uh, Rwanda, for example, we have the policy of making sure that at least 60% of the students graduating from lower secondary education, they actually they should follow the track of the technical and vocation training, and only 40% goes to the general education. That is in line of how many people do you need at the top and how many middle-level technicians you need to assist these people on the top notch. And to that effect, actually we have crafted a, a curricula, the cross curricula which provides the pathways between the general education and the technical education because in the past, the people who followed the technical education, they seem to be the people who were academic failures or who will hit a deadlock because there is no such flexibility and pathways at any point of time to switch from one discipline to another. M so I think these are key three areas which you need to address. Minister, allow me to push back a little bit. How then do you encourage uh, the idea you've proposed, like, like the 40-60 rule? Because like in my home country, Kenya, a lot of the technical institutions have now been converted to be constituent colleges of universities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of young people would want a degree in anthropology, uh, other than engineering, for example. This is a system that, it is the opportunities that are there that are pushing them there. It's not that they do not want, how do you encourage them to go that route? Um, in the current situation where the formal employment is dwindling, and actually we are encouraging people to acquire knowledge and skills so that they can translate these skills and knowledge into creating jobs for themselves and for others. I think we need to find the convergence between the general curricula and the TVET curricula. And this convergence can be provided only when we are not only focusing on the technical and the hard skills per se, but we need also to focus on the soft areas. For example, uh, entrepreneurship nowadays shouldn't be seen as a standalone subject. Rather, entrepreneurship and innovation, it should be embedded across horizontally and vertically in all other curricula which you are teaching. And in so doing, I can see that uh, you sh we should be able to provide the convergence between the general education and the technical education. That's one. But also we need to provide the opportunity, more opportunity, by building more uh, institutions, you know, not only at the tertiary level, but also the second level, right. vocational tra technical training institutions instead of uh, rolling out <laughs> general secondary schools. Right, Mr. Kato, still on the same issue of uh, uh, how prepared are our young people for the future? Thank you. Uh, I think it depends on the development strategy of the country. If a certain country think, thinks that um, you know, they can develop their country by uh, developing uh, and building a huge number of um, factories, and inviting lots of uh, foreign investors uh, which, who will, will recruit local uh, people, then may they can uh, arrange a, a university education in such a way that young people will be well prepared to work for big factories and big companies. But I'm, I doubt if it is possible in many of African countries because a, unfortunately, infrastructure is still very uh, lacking and um, many other uh, co conditions that will induce large farms uh, in foreign countries to invest in Africa. Therefore, I think uh, many African countries must tap into the entrepreneurship uh, potentials of the young people. Uh, instead of telling them and preparing them to work for large companies, maybe we have to prepare them to uh, be an entrepreneur and to be creatively self-employed. And in order for that, maybe we need to have a different type of uh, uh, tertiary education and uh, stressing the importance of innovation and the proactive pro product, uh, problem solving. And again, that's what we have been doing with uh, Jomo Kenya at the university, trying to encourage the uh, creative and um, entrepreneur-like 
behaviors of the young people. And also in Rwanda too, I think uh, the Rwandan government has been doing a lot of work to encourage the young people who are very much familiar with ICT skills and knowledge, and they, what they lack is a small amount of seed money. So therefore, maybe the Rwandan government is trying to do is to encourage the young people to come together and learn from each other and provide some seed money and be, uh, grow it to young entrepreneurs. And that's the type of uh, high uh, tertiary education many of the countries, African countries need for the moment. All right, let's have Professor Sachs before I come to uh, Dr. Price. Still on the same issue. Um, we're talking about this preparedness and we've outlined the situation in which we find ourselves, but we cannot sit and wait. What do we need to deconstruct? I think one thing should be obvious, uh, and it hasn't been mentioned. Uh, we're talking about improving university education, which is what brings us here, and it's crucial. But the situation in primary and secondary education in Africa is dire. Uh, and so these are not to be uh, competing agendas, they're part of the same agenda. The completion rate of secondary school in sub-Saharan Africa remains less than 25 percent. That's an impossibility for development. So this is absolutely why SDG 4 was agreed, which is universal secondary completion by 2030. That by itself is a research problem also. I would like universities to ask themselves the question, how can our country achieve universal secondary education within under 15 years? It can't be done the normal way. It's not the normal cycle. It has to be done through a number of innovations, again, with information technology and linked classrooms and different ways to scale beyond what we have done before. But the goal here is not simply outstanding elite institutions, which are crucial, but also mass education, especially through the secondary level. And there are many, many indicators that this is not happening properly right now. And I'd like to mention a point of terminology because I think that there's uh, also a big issue here. It's highly controversial. Uh, many people are sensitive to it, but I think it's important to state. What does the demographic dividend mean? It does not mean a lot of young people. The demographic dividend means a lot of young people followed by much fewer younger people. The demographic dividend is only achieved through a reduction of fertility. It does not mean every generation has young people, bigger and bigger. Africa's current trajectory is a fertility rate of five, which is the average across the continent, by far the highest in the world and a demographic medium forecast of reaching 4 billion people in 2100. That's not a demographic dividend. You could say, well, Africa will have most of the young people in the world. That's true. And it will have the highest young dependency rate in the world by far, which is not a dividend, it's a burden. So how did China leapfrog in education? by a dramatic decline of the total fertility rate so that the investment per child was multiplied tremendously. In a poor family with five children where one gets an education and the other do not, that's not a It's really important, again, this is taking us a, a little bit beyond our topic, but the basic idea of, uh, for Africa's breakthrough, in my view, includes universal secondary completion now. That every, every uh, country is saying, if you're in school, we're going to help you stay in school till at least the end of high school, girls and boys, not dropping out in sixth grade or seventh grade, especially for girls. But everybody continues through. That by itself will be 
the number one factor in reducing fertility rates by far. Right. Then many of those, and we should think about that, but I would say aiming for at least 20 or 25 percent in some way, and it will evolve institutionally what it means, becoming part of tertiary education, three or four times the rate of now. But those need to be quantified, all of those, uh, uh, those parameters. But don't think that the situation is even close to adequate right now, because both on the measured quality of the outputs at age 13 and 15, Africa is ranking very low, and the proportion of kids staying in school at those levels is dreadfully low. Now, I'm the first to say this can be turned around faster than ever seen in history before. That's my very strong belief, and not just out of wishful thinking or being nice, but very practical means. Now, let's make the change. But the current situation, not even close to adequate. Right, all right. Let's uh, very quickly hear from uh, Dr. Price then. I'll open uh, this session to just three questions from the audience, because I know there are a lot of vice chancellors who are seated amongst us, and they may want to have an input on this conversation. Uh, Dr. Price. I'm picking up your question on are we producing the right graduates and are they the right match for what society needs? And that question arises because we often hear talk about unemployed graduates and the risk that we just have more graduates but don't actually address the economic needs of society. Um, and my caution is to, or I want to caution that, um, although we're talking as a continent, uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity, and even within a country, we need to understand the causes of graduate unemployment before we jump to fixing it. And I think the causes are different in different places. Within, within South Africa, the cause may have a lot to do with the quality rather than the curricula and the subjects and whether there has been partnerships with industry and et cetera. Or it may have to do with the schooling or the, the fact that universities, because of a sort of ranking that happens almost automatically, some universities attract students from one set of schools that have had a much uh, 12 years of very good schooling, and other universities are attracting uh, kids who have a weaker schooling, and the product may be, they may not have, the, if it's a standard curriculum, a three-year degree or a four-year degree, that may not be suited to the different inputs. So we need to understand whether it is quality, it may be that the curricula are not appropriate, and uh, I think that's going to be the case, but that requires a different solution. It may be that employers are expecting work, uh, graduates to be work ready, and that requires a discussion between us, because most of our curricula, from the university's point of view, are not designed to make people work ready at the time of graduation. We expect a car ma manufacturer to take one of our engineers and have to still train them for two years before they can really function independently. Because the nature of our engineering degree is to produce engineers for a hundred different engineering industries. And you couldn't specialize them in all of that, and that would be inappropriate. So we do a sort of generic stem cell engineer, if you like, who can then differentiate. Uh, into. So there may be a mismatch of expectations as well. Um, and then uh, I think we also need to do more research on the extent to which the non-STEM graduates are getting jobs because there's a risk that with all the emphasis on more STEM that uh, there's an undertone, there's, a, there's an implication that those who are doing humanities, social sciences, law uh, are not as needed in the economy and not as successful in the economy. And while that may be true in some cases, I think that actually reflects quality more than curriculum content. We, need, we recognize that our graduates will probably have four or five jobs in their lives, and that when they, but they'll only be at university full time once and that this university experience is a, an opportunity to prepare them for all of those four jobs with a whole range of generic skills rather than the first job that they're going to get after graduating. So that discussion, I think, needs to be unpacked in more detail. Right. Thank you th for that, uh, Dr. Price. At, at this point, I'd like to open this conversation to uh, <clears throat> members of the audience. I do understand there are a lot of education professionals here. So if you have a question, just put your hand up. I'll give you a chance to ask just one question. Be clear who on the panel you'd like to address, and then we'll take it. I'll take it from the, uh, the lady on the far end. Tell us your name, where you're from, and be brief. 
Thank you so much. Um, my name is Janine Chondo. I'm a biomedical center. So my question goes to Dr. Max on um, quality dimension. Clearly, we can see that quality was kind of misled and probably towards some universities. So the question that I have is the, the papers. You know, back from the university, I used to count the number of papers that I'm, I'm publishing. But now in the implementation institution, I'm asking how many of those papers information is being used for policy change. So the question is, can we use that? How many of the information, how much of the information that you're producing is being used by WHO guideline and, and the policy change? So the second question goes to Professor Jeffrey let, let, Let's just have one question so that we allow more people. Oh, just one? Yes, yes, Thank please. you. Right, let me have uh, the gentleman right there. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Tombola Gustave. I'm from the University of Tourism, Technology and Business Studies. I'm not having a question as such, but it's a contribution to what do I, un what do I understand by quality tertiary education. Right. To my view, quality tertiary education comprises many aspects. Among them, quality curriculum. Quality curriculum which fits for the purpose of the labor market. Number two, quality staff who are ready to deliver the curriculum to the labor market level and even conduct the research. Number three is about quality students. The quality tertiary education cannot be talked about without those coming from the lower level going to the tertiary education. Number four is about the infrastructure. The infrastructure has to be of quality. I mean laboratories, I mean equipments, I mean all the aspects of infrastructure, the broadband, right. okay, I'm about to end. Yes. Even the governance should not be left behind. To conclude, ranking or benchmarking will be coming to assess if quality is there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, let me give this chance to the lady here. She put her hand up. Then I'll come to this end for the next round, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, moderator. I'm Alice Rusero Karikezi of the Center for Conflict Management at the University of Rwanda. My remark comes uh, from the need to create new models of uh, learning and teaching. Um, from what I understand from the panel uh, discussion, what you are describing as a need, a requirement, or perhaps even an imperative for uh, the universities in Africa to be an agent of uh, sustainable development would require a revolution liberation of the mind. Because if it is true that we have a tremendous opportunities as uh, described by Fred Swaninka, to create a, a lot kind of ways we want to see our university going, but we have also what he said, we are stuck in our legacy. Who is going to create the models we want? Because one reality of the higher education system is also this is a place where conservatism is in abundance. So who are going to be the agent who revolutionize, if I can say, right. the university? Thank you. Thank you. And probably uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Price respond to the question. And then, uh, Fred, if you have a, a comment on her issue of who will lead this revolution. And then I'll come to uh, one last round. Okay? Mr. Price. Uh, I completely agree with the questioner um, that we very often assume quality is just the number of publications and that that is leading to all sorts of perverse consequences and is not a measure of quality. Um, there are many uh, attempts to find alternatives and I'll just 
list three by way of example. I don't think we know which is the best way. But the first, which is in the, U in, in the UK, in the research assessment exercise, is to say to researchers, you can only present five publications. Whether you've done 100 or 200 or seven, you can only present your top five. And we'll only assess you on that. So that it shifts the focus dramatically from quantity to quality. Um, the second is to say, around all of your research, you must tell us what the impact is. And the examples you gave of showing that the research productivity, the, the output of the research appears in WHO policy documents or in government documents or that it's been discussed in a parliamentary committee or that a community has used it, um, those are measures of impact. It's much harder to, objective, or to do that objectively. It doesn't fit in with ranking systems, etc., easily because it's so putting energy. A third is looking, why, when one is in a more traditional academic environment, looking at citations, which is commonly done. How many people think that the work you've done is worth quoting? Um, and, and that still is, uh, I think, a reasonably good measure. In all of these things, we need to remember to standardize these across fields. So in some areas, if you're in cell biology and you, you write something, it will be quoted thousands of times uh, it'll be widely distributed and uh, many other people will use it because the next time someone does a gene experiment they've got to use your, the test that you designed. Um, whereas it may, possibly if you're looking at flooding in a regional community, no one else will, the, will read that and so, or except for the people in that community. And so we have to be careful not to allow those things to become again measures of rankings uh, inappropriately. But I do agree with you strongly that impact should, uh, the impact must be a much stronger measure of quality than it has been. This is Dr. Sonica. <clears throat> um, yes, I would agree with, um, with the question there that um, higher education in Africa needs a revolution. Um, because we, I think Africa has two choices. We can either wait for young people to come out you know, 30, 40 years from now without any opportunities, without any skills, without any entrepreneurship, and then they create a revolution because they don't have opportunities. Or well, we can revolutionize our higher education systems and in fact our entire education systems to make sure that we never get to that point. And, you know, I think the, we have been too conservative and um, the, the way, for example, um, you know, a lot of um, uh, qualities assessed and everything is we'll, we'll need and uh, we'll have new models because I, you know, we have a unique opportunity. What happened with the mobile phone when, which came to Africa and allowed us to leapfrog and in, in 15 years we went from a few hundred phone lines to 700 million with access to telecommunications. We have the same opportunity with education and we can either take that opportunity or we can do business as usual. <clears throat> business as usual will not get us where we need to get to. Thank you very much. Let's hear from Dr. Hamdok and then I'll have one last round of questions. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Moderator. I think uh, there's definitely a need for uh, an education, tertiary education revolution, but I would like to believe this is a revolution that will have to be led by a balanced approach. Let me explain further. I think the uh, strategies that have prevailed in the continent where transformed our state into a watchman will not work here, reducing it to a minimalist state. The other extreme also of going full-fledged uh, public sector will not work. I would like to think we need a balanced approach whereby the state provide the direction, the vision and all that, but also includes maybe consultation and working together with the private sector, linking education sector to the industry and all that, whether you are talking about small and medium scale industries or bigger strategic industries. That is an extremely important and experiences of uh, newly industrialized countries telling us exactly that. So I think this is, uh, I would like to believe, the way we can uh, move uh, forward. And since I'm having the uh, the, the, the microphone, I would like just to mention briefly, working together with the SDG Center, we are embarking on a number of uh, initiatives together. One of them is to support this 
uh, high level, uh, the, the higher education or tertiary education initiative. We will work together with the center on that. But a number of other issues linking to managing natural resource for development, addressing issues of illicit financial flows, the new issue of migration challenges and all that, and particularly looking at it from an African perspective, which is essentially developmental, and see how we can work together with the center uh, on this. Another area is to work together on a publication, which we have advanced, uh, maybe discussion in this direction. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Before I come uh, back to Professor Sachs, let me just give two last questions. There's a gentleman at the very end, and uh, I'll come to that very end as well. Make it very brief, please. Uh, from uh, University of Kigali. Now, I want to draw something from what His Excellence talked about in the, his introductory remarks, where he said uh, we have to work in some kind of a triangle. We have the government, we have private sector, and the universities. But I want to look at the private sector in the education system and what the government has done to help out. This will go to the minister to highlight a bit. Uh, now, my issue is most of the governments we have concentrate more on the public universities and the students within the public universities. But when you look at uh, the population of the students we churn out, the private churns out many students compared to the public. But if it's research fund, it goes to the public. If it is uh, career development, to the public. Is there a way you can be able to initiate some kind of uh, a share deal with the private sector within education so that we share out, so that we all uh, put out students who are going to help out the university, sorry, to help out the country at once? So, Thank so you. That question is to the minister, right? Yes. Okay, let's have the last question at the end. Thank you very much. My question is direct. I'm Dr. Stephen Durisa from University of Rwanda. My question is directed to Professor Sachs. He talked about um, fertility rate being a very important factor in economic development. And the question is, if you, if you invest in fertility rate, we know that the less educated you are, the more children you tend to have. And the poorer you are, the more children you have. Now the question is, education is a major factor in the fertility rate, determining fertility rate, especially in family planning uptake. Depends on how educated you are. Now, in African setting where resources are limited, where would you invest more? In reducing fertility rates or in educating people which eventually will reduce the fertility rate? Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to propose to my panel to have the minister take the first question as you make your closing remarks, followed by Professor Sachs as you make your closing remarks, and then the rest of the panelists will each have a minute just to make your closing remarks. Let's start with Minister. Thank you. Uh, the, the question of uh, the facilitation extended by government to the private providers in tertiary education, uh, it's always there because we, we have uh, the profile of the skills gap and this assessment is being conducted from time to time. Now, if there is an initiative geared towards bridging this gap through the public partner, public-private partnership, there is always a scope of uh, extending support. Actually, we have seen examples, uh, these examples I mentioned earlier on, where government either contributes the budget or the government contributes the land, for example, if you want to set, to set up uh, an institution for training and research innovation within Kigali um, Innovation Hub. So th that is the support which is there. But uh, the issue is, when you come up with a program just because of uh, the open market policy, government, of course, will not uh, dictate that. But the thing is, if you really want to attract uh, the support of the government at the policy level, the investment, and all of that, I think it has to be in line with those profile of the skills which we need to drive our socioeconomic development. As far as uh, tapping to the research fund, I think there is an opportunity of uh, setting uh, research and innovation fund. But also, uh, the research innovation fund will be tied up 
to the national research agenda for any contributors, be it either public or the private institution or just an independent person. As long as you are undertaking a research and innovation project which is in line of the national research agenda, definitely that person is uh, standing a huge chances of tapping resources from that national research and innovation fund. Right, Professor. Thank you. Uh, I don't think it's uh, such a difficult choice, actually, uh, nor such an expense. Uh, just looking at the data for China, uh, for China in uh, 1970 to 75, the total fertility rate was 4.8. Okay. 20 years later, 1990 to 95, the total fertility rate was 1.9. So it declined in a 20-year period by three children on average. This was basically mass education and mass availability of primary health care, including family planning and contraception. There's no big mystery to this, and it can go even faster than this. Uh, Keep the girls in school, for sure. This is a sine qua non for ever that all kids that are right now in school can finish secondary, and any children that are starting have the prospect at least through secondary. And make sure there are clinics everywhere, that's all. That's not beyond expense, beyond means, beyond planning. The rest will take care of itself. Uh, as it has uh, wherever that's been done. So you don't need uh, more, uh, more than that. And for Africa, it'll make a huge difference because the difference will be a tremendous boost. I've done quantification of this. If you have a quick fertility reduction, you basically double the per capita income by mid-century, roughly speaking depends on, on the specifics, but it's a huge, huge fact. Whether the population is runaway population as it is in many rural areas in Africa, by the way, where farm sizes are already down below one hectare per, per family, or whether there's really the transformation that we're all looking for and expecting. So I don't see this as much of a trade-off because the costs are not uh, are, are really not uh, very significant. It's a policy decision. And I do think that for every country, uh, the basic standard should be if the children are in school, they should expect to stay in school till they complete a secondary education. That requires a lot of scrambling for spaces, for secondary schools, for the curriculum and the teachers. And for the teachers, that's where IT is going to have to come in to expand the access very, very rapidly. And it's where international funds could really also play a role, because I do think there can and should be a fund for African education, mainly for this purpose, which is to ensure universality of primary and secondary completion by 2030, and I know the Secretary General is very interested in helping on that, and I think that this can, can be accomplished. On the, the revolution of higher education, the question is who's gonna lead it? Please, you lead it. Please, universities, take a lead about what's needed. I've been fighting my own universities for decades. You know, it's not, you have to make change. I said 25 years ago, we should be, 30 years ago at Harvard, we should be working more outside, not inside. Well, a lot of my colleagues didn't like that. So what? Of course it's going to be an effort. But my standard would not be, what does the labor market want? My standard would be, what does society need? The labor market will come around to that. For example, you need a lot more teachers, you need a lot more health workers, you need a lot more information technology engineers. It's clear the kinds of needs in the future. Train for them. The market will be there, by the way. Train for what's needed. 
and especially study the sustainable development goals because they really are a pretty good short list of what is necessary for a well-functioning society. Universal access to health, universal access to education, universal access to electricity. That requires a lot of engineers who know how to mobilize solar, how to mobilize the vast renewable energy potential of this continent, which is enormous. One thing that I want to agree completely with many people that have said here, do not make the standards how many publications there are in American journals. This is ridiculous. American journals don't care about African problems. So make the standards evaluating the quality of research for the problems that the researcher is researching. That's very important. That requires, by the way, in my own university, they sometimes go through a checklist. Well, those are the five leading journals. But there, some of them are lousy, in my view, in terms of what topics they print, publish. Very esoteric topics that are not relevant, especially for you. You should be publishing, I would say, in topics that are absolutely relevant for African society. The disease burdens are different, the epidemiology is different, the renewable energy resources are different, the ecology is different, the solution space is different, the market dynamics are different. So African journals are great places to publish, absolutely, and they should be given a very high score for the faculty performance because they're going to be the ones publishing topics that are of interest and that are relevant for you. So be bold, but also don't cut corners on it. The standards matter, the quality of learning really <coughs> intellectual leaders who are going to make, make a very big difference, and that you can't cut corners on. That is, is really hard work, but a lot of innovation is important. And I couldn't agree more. Do not use Princeton or Columbia or Harvard as your role models. Of course, if they want to open a campus in your neighborhood, good, because they'll have to evolve dramatically in order to perform adequately. But those are not the role models for you. But the standards of evaluation are going to change tremendously in the coming 15 years very, very fast because we can deliver education in completely new ways, as, uh, as you've been saying. And I, I concur 100% with that. So evaluating on that basis is also important. But the whole world is going to be evaluated on that basis very soon. Right. <clears throat> And I'd like just to give a minute each to my other four panelists to give you closing comments. Uh, let's start uh, at the very end. Uh, Mr. Toka, coming down. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. I'd like to talk a bit about partnership. Uh, despite the less than optimal situation of tertiary education in Africa, I think the opportunities are huge because many countries outside Africa, governments, uh, universities and international cooperation organizations believe in the bright future of Africa and the investment in, make, in tertiary education in Africa is worthwhile. Many, people, many organizations believe that way. So in that sense, maybe universities uh, in Africa have an, um, faced with a huge opportunities and or partnerships and hundreds and thousands of organizations are offering research grants and scholarships and so opportunities are there. And of course, in choosing a partnership, of course, you, you tend to uh, think of uh, your traditional partners like Europe and the United States because of your historical relationship as well as their competence in science and technology, both in Europe and, and, and the, in the US. But I would like to ask you to look at other possibilities like Asia, as, um, because many of the uh, knowledge and experiences acquired in Asian countries, Japan is a little bit uh, early uh, example of development, but Korea, Taiwan, you know, in Southeast Asia, China, and all these countries have ample opportunities to share 
ample experiences to share with you. And maybe Latin America too. So I think the, this uh, movement uh, driven by the SDG Center for Africa is, uh, in, in essence, uh, how to, we enlarge and expand the a partnership across the world. And if that is the motive of SDG Center for Africa, my organization will be very happy to contribute our humble contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Price. Um, a, a, a short comment and, and, and a question, really. The comment is that I think uh, it was raised earlier, and I would have put it in my input, that there's some low-hanging fruit with respect to access to electronic databases. And it is iniquitous that uh, in relatively poor countries, we have to pay for something which actually the marginal cost of which is almost zero. Um, and now, with the open access movement and the requirement that, which is a good thing, of course, it means we can access journals and books without paying, but that is, has come back to bite us because the article processing fees the amount you have to pay up front in order to get your article into an open access journal is now extremely high. And so we're, so we're finding, a, again, a perverse consequence that academics in developing countries are not publishing in open access journals because it's too expensive to publish in them, and you carry the cost. And so I think there's something which we can fix there relatively quickly. Um, it's an important that we should all move into open access and also that we should be negotiating en masse with the publishers to get better deals. Uh, my question, which I'm throwing out, uh, reflecting my ignorance, is that um, uh, picking up the question of is there going to be a revolution and is that revolution driven by the developments in IT, the, particularly the points I think Fred was, was highlighting, um, our own very limited experience is that it's turning out to be more expensive that the use of IT in distance learning and accessing lots of students who are not coming to a campus <coughs> but are, are remote from a campus, uh, to, re to retain the same quality is not cheaper. And I would be interested, um, it's a question for discussion somewhere or for research or for someone to pull together the experience of whether what, what we're doing wrong or what needs to be done to ensure that this technology actually become, give, improves our productivity. Right. Thank you. Dr. Hamdok. Thank you very much. I think rapidly three points. Number one is the issue of innovative financing of tertiary education. If you look around this room, people in their 50s and 60s are the product of the free education of those days. It might not be affordable today, but I think we need to think about education as a key, as a prime, as a priority moving forward. Number two, I think we need to think about uh, building economies of scale in education. Africa is embarking on each and every one of our universities to specialize in everything else. Let us have, for instance, as an example, Rwanda take lead on issues of uh, ICT, technology, and all that. Other places, trade, medicine, and that. And build economies of scale that will benefit regions and the entire continent. And finally, I think we can benefit a lot from tapping into the huge resources that are available in our diaspora integrating with them, linking with them, and you can innovate here. They can give us part of their uh, leave, take one or two months, sabbatical and all that, spend them in the continent. I think this way we can begin to go into the right direction of building our tertiary education and go back to the glory days of McCreary, Abadan, and others. It's doable and we can do it. We've done it before. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Sonica. Um, my closing remarks really just um, a, a, a thought, a reflection. Um, I believe that it's, it's getting faster and faster to develop countries. If you go back and you think about how long it took Europe to develop, uh, it probably would take about a thousand years from when they had the levels of poverty that we see in Africa until they reached high income status. The USA started that journey, took them about 300 years. When Japan started that journey, it took them 100 years. Singapore and Korea did it in 60 years. And China has done it in 30 years. Dubai maybe in 15 years. I think at the heart of all this has been two things, education and good leadership. And I believe that we have a unique opportunity, and I'm seeing that here in Rwanda when I just think about what has happened in the last 20 years. 
to rapidly develop our societies. And there are many things that, are dis that we have a disadvantage in, in Africa. There's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of you know, infrastructure challenges and everything, but the one thing we have is a clean slate. And if we think differently, we have the opportunity to actually take leadership as a continent and create the universities of the future, not just for Africa, but for the world. And if we do this, then it won't take us 100 years to see the levels of prosperity that we need to see on the continent, but it requires different thinking. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you to all my panelists. It's been an absolute pleasure exploring the question of t uh, quality of tertiary education in this SDG era and the Agenda 2063 and trying to find the context in which, as Africa, we find ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pass a special thanks to my panelists, Mr. Hiroshi Kato, Dr. Max Price, Minister uh, Musafiri Malimba, Dr. Abdullah Ham Hamdok, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, and Dr. Fred Swanik. A round of applause, please. <clears throat> I would also like to pass a special thanks to our guest of honor, His Excellency the President Paul Kagame, for being part of this conversation. Round of applause, please. <laughs> and so I'd like to ask as you may remain uh, seated as His Excellency takes his leave. Yeah, oh, even better, we can live together. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for being part of this amazing audience. Thank you. I believe lunch will be served shortly. You'll be guided through. Thank you once again. Mukorera mukomeje kujya televiziyo y'u Rwanda umunsi wa mbere w'inama ya SDG Center for Africa yo kaba rero umuje aho rero hari ari panel discussion ibiganiro rero bya horiyomo ni mu guke nyinshi zitandukanye ambiyutsa ko rero i SDG CA ari ikigo gifasha za kaminuza guverinoma nabikorera kugira uruhare mu kwihutisha ishyamba bikorwa y'intego z'iterambere rambye bakaba rero bigiraga hamwe ireme ry'uburezi mu mashuri makuru ikiganiro cyakirimo gihumuje none aha cyavugaga kubijyanye n'ireme ry'uburezi muri kaminuza mu gihe cy'intego z'iterambere rirambye ariko bijyana na gahunda ya Africa Union nayo agenda 2063 ukuntu babihuza iyi gahunda ya SDG CA ikaba rero ari gahunda igomba guzwa n'imyaka kugira mu mwaka wa 2033 ni gahunda rero y'imyaka Chuminitano, ya SDG, Avakabadi, Yabari Ramu, Okono Gaunda, Yahuzwana Gaunda, African Union, Ario Agenda 2063, Bakariva, Okon, Remedu, Ziri, Shora, Akrosha, Gutera, Imbe. When Dam Banyumo, Machi, Mubigani, Riho, Bagarze, Kushima, Vikana, Guadakurwa, Semoko, Zanazime, Muriza Camino, Zitano, Kanyako, Girango, even the Yatanga, Dr. Papias, Awe of Zeko, Aoko Girango, Ayugo, Jukomezeko, is our Venshi Hansa, and Yashi Venshi Hansa. Women in the visa ego, Arikom would you quishakamo, if you subiz on your gambi ramji, no kohara my institutions, changa say if you go a women if you go back on Zakamino Zomurwanda, because an Yobigashinga, Zakamino Zamujugu, Kujangorero, I've been a gabanye chajichiro by the commercial garukaho, the chiro chijan chuchuzi no mosi. And only if Yagarutskeho Muri Chino Chigani Ro Chavga Kurimed Juburizi Muri Zakaminoza Muji Chine Gozitra Mbere Ramji Bagarutse Kuchi Kujira Kamino zazi shoboye ati bihugu bikabanza bikishakamo ibisubizo hagati yabyo bamara kushakamo ibisubizo bakabona gushinga nano neza kamenu zazitanga uburezi ufitireme bigende muri kino kinyeje na tugezemo bati hari ibisubizo bimwe mu bihugu bimwe na bimwe bamaze kwishakamo nko gukorana nibigo by'imari mu kurihira abanyeshuri abanyeshuri bazasoza amasomo yabo bakazagenda bishyura gahoro gahoro bya bigo by'imari ati ubu nubundi buryo buzakemura ikibazo cy'abanyeshuri bat 
bata barangiza secondaire ni bagiye muri za kaminuza kubera kwa henshi usanga babuze ubushobozi bakava ko rero nibindi bigo bira mutse bikoresheje uburyo hari byinshi bishobora kugirwa mu gukemura ikibazo cy'abanyeshuri basoza za kaminuza cyangwa se bata nabo basoza amashuri yisumbuye bakabura ubushobozi cyangwa se babagiye muri za kaminuza agakeshiza amashuri agati kubera ko wenda yabuze uko akomeza kuyiga bata none hakwiye kandi kubaho ibigo bikomeye bikwiye kujya bishora imari mu burezi anga bakangura nanone uyinzego za bikorera ya no hino ko ziramusizegereye izi kaminuza zo muri Afrika bagakora na bugufi hari byinshi bashobora kugira aho bati Afrika rero ikeneye guhanga byibura imirimo igera kuri miliyoni 10 mu gihe cy'imyaka 10 ibiro bizaca ubushomeri ku banyeshuri barangije za kaminuza babura kazi ugasanga bwa umenyi bakuye mu mashuri abwo barabyicaje nacyo buri mu kumara batari ko rero habaye ho guhanga iyi mirimo mushya igera kuri miliyoni 10 mu gihe cy'imyaka 10 ari byinshi bishobora gukemura mu bijyanye no guhanga imirimo nano no gukoresha neza bwa umenyi bavanye mu ishuri bati rero urwanda no rugero rwiza mu gushyira mu bikorwa intego z'ikinyagihumbi ari zo zasojwe mbere ko hajyaho SDGs kuko nko mu myaka yashize abageraga kuri ku bihumbi bine nibo bari barakandagiye muri kaminuza ariko kugeza ku no munsi umwaka ushize mu mwaka 2016 abageze abari muri kaminuza bakabasaga ibihumbi 186 bagarutse kugiranye na ranking cyangwa se ukuntu ibihugu bigenda bishyirwa ku myanya uko bigenda birushanwa mu bijyanye ubwo ndavuga mu burezi muri za kaminuza batero kuba uko tutanye tubivuga kuba muri za kaminuza igihumbi za mbere kwisi ubona ko harimo icumi zo nyezi turutse muri Afrika nizo turutse muri Afrika ugasanga enye nizo muri Afrika y'epfo mu gihe izindi enye ari zo muri Egypte bati icyo cumi muri kaminuza igihumbi ne kaminuza nkiya cyane yabwa kuye gukorwa byinshi kurushaho bakavuga ari intego bihaye ko byibura mu mwaka wa 2023 byibura kaminuza 25 zo muri Afrika zaza muri kaminuza 300 za mbere kwisi bati rero ranking naga bitugenderaho kuza kuri yo myanya ya mbere si cyo kingenzi atahubwo Afrika ikuye kumenya icyo ikeneye izikamiriza zikuye kumenya icyo abanyeshuri bakeneye ako bizivatanyije nabikorera cyangwa se izego za leta ubwo ni za ministere birumvikana cyangwa se zego zifitaho zihuriye n'uburezi bakareba niba ikeneye gusoko ryo muri mu munsi bigende no mu kinyeje na tugezemo bati rero umubari w'ibitabo cyangwa se ubushagashatsi bishirwa hanze umunsi kuwundi nabwo ari byo byihutirwa na gari cyo kingenzi ahubwo ikiri igikoma cyo kuma kwitabgaho ni reme rya bwa bushagashatsi bwa gishyizwe hanze kugira ngo numwana uri muri kaminuza usoje kaminuza n'amukagoze ari ibyo muri bwa bushagashatsi hari cyo ashobora kuza kuramo nanone bakaba bagarutse kubijyanye n'ikora na buhanga ati rahari ryashyizweho mu yo kugira afika byinshi maze gukataza kuba afite ikora na buhanga atari ko none igisigaye nuko dikwe gukoreshwa neza mu bushagashatsi abari mu muri kaminuza bagakora bushagashatsi abantu bagahanga dushya abanyeshuri nuko bakoshije bya ko na buhanga ko Afrika imaze kuribona bati rero hakuye kandi kongera ubushobozi ibigo by'ubushakashatsi muri Afrika ibizafasha rero abanyeshuri kujya muri bya bitabo abashakashatsi ba bashiza hagaragara maze nabo bahere kuri ibyo ngibyo bateze imbere umugabane ibi biro bikabishimangira cyangwa se bijya mu rungu umwe mu jambo rya president wa Republika yavuze ko uburezi gushora imari mu burezi ari investment cyangwa se ari shora mari y'igihe kirekire bitanga umusaruro mu nyuma nanone mu bigarutswe ho muri iki nero none aha bagarutse yaho gukangurira abanyeshuri bo muri Afrika gukorera za za bati aho gukorera gukangurira abanyeshuri bo muri Afrika gukorera za societe zikomeye atahubwo bakwiye kubashishikariza kuba barwemeza mirimo bato kandi bahanga udusha ati ibintu byo byari bakwiye kurushaho gushishikarizwa aho kubabwira ngo urangije kwigaje no kuri no societe ni ikomeye atahubwo mushishikarize cyangwa se mwerekeye uko ashobora kwiyangira umurimo ibintu byo bizatuma yiteza imbere sagateza n'imbere umugabane we batano dukwiye gushiraho uburyo burambye bubereye uburezi bwa Afrika muri iki kinyejana tugezemo nkuko nabivuze kanya gatoya ibi byagarutswe cyane mu gusoza rero bagarutse ku burezi ati uburezi bwari bukuye rero kuba practical byabino dukora utuvana mu ishuri mu mapuro abo tukajya kuri kozo n'imitwe ino kitubireba ati kandi za kaminuza nazo zigakorana nabikorera mu guhanga imirimo umwana ashobora kuva mu ishuri akajya kwimenyereza umwuga cyangwa se
kurekorera ibindi bye ati abana babakobwa bayo bakwiye kuganishwa ishuri bakubakorera ko gukangurira kurushaho gukunda no kugana ishuri ati ro bibi bizatuma rero barangiza amashuri yisumbuye bafite n'inyota yo gukomeza kumenya ese muri kaminoza ho bijagaze gute gifashe gute ati imindoka impindu kubgazo zizigaragaza ntabwo ari ngombwa ko uzamukangura cyangwa uzamwibutsa cyangwa se uzamuhitura gukora ibyo akora ariko bibusheshikaje mbere ubwe bizamubira umusemburo ati ikibazo rero ni gikuye kuba niki isoko rikeneye atahubwo cyakagombye kuba niki societe ikeneye umunamenya icyo societe ikeneye wa mwandiri mu ishuri azamanuka agende akorebwa bushakashatsi cyangwa se ahange udushya bijyanye nibyo societe ikeneye mu gusoza rero nagira ngo ambiwutse ko iyari inama y'iminsi ibiri mu gutranira angaha ikigali aho rero iri mu kurebera hamwe uko ireme ry'uburezi muri Afrika rishobora kurushaho gutera imbere ambiwutse kandi inama yateguwe na SDG Central Africa akaba ari ikigore gifasha za kaminuza guverinoma nabikorera kugira uruhare mu kwihutisha ishyirwa mu bikorwa by'intego ziterambere rirambye makoze kwana natwe rero nshimira equipe technique yose yadufashije kugira ngo inama ku munsi wa mbere wayo imukwiranga ikigari bagireho kana televiziyo rwanda izakomeza kwakurikiranira kugeza ku munsi wejo ubwo izaba isojwe aho no tuzana minyari myanzuro yavuye mu nona amandetse nicyo bigiye kumarira uburezi bwa Afrika ariko byo rwanda n'urwanda muri rusange ubwo rero abanyeshuri aho muri hose twabashishikaza ko mwakomeza kurikana iyo mvuga nkora nyambaga mu kumva rero iyi nama ko anene irimo iriga kuri byinshi kwemera byo burezi rireba cyane cyane wowe uri muri kaminuza koko rimeraganira ku mashuri makuru na za kaminuza mukomeze munogerwe nibindi biganiro bya televiziyo y'u Rwanda yabateguriye mwari kumwe na Andrew Karim